Ah, uh, this is Behind the Bastards. It's a podcast about Miles. No. Miles. Nope. <laughs> it's not how do you about plan, me. How do you plan to make all of your mini crimes right? Look, I start by my manager said and my publicist both said go on this podcast. So it's, thanks so much for having mm-hmm. me. Um and of course, of course, always happy to have oh, a work. You know, exactly. And show. I think and the first thing what I'm trying to do is sort of challenge what our conventional definition of what a war crime is. Hmm. Um, and I think that's my task today as a guest on your podcast. Thanks so much for having well, me. Again. Well, that's fascinating. You know, I read about your 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 rebranding of war crimes in that Barry mm-hmm. Weiss column. And I just mm-hmm. thought very brave, very brave. It's Bari, brave. actually. It's, it's Bari. Yeah. So Bari. that's my best friend. Well, so, OK. Go, yeah. He refuses to learn her name. I I've told him many times. That's a nice yeah, well, way. You of should have, saying, yeah, respect for one of the of America's greatest journalists since great Upton Sinclair. Sure, yeah, absolutely. She's the Glenn Greenwald of Glenn Greenwalds. Um, <laughs> this is the podcast about bad people. Tell you all about them, Miles. It's part three of our of our series. I'm so on exhausted, Clarence Thomas. How you doing? How you doing? We took a little breaky. Little Dude. breaky for us. Yeah, good. Now it was good to have the break. I kept telling everybody I was doing this, and I was like, ah, the first two episodes just fucking spooked me out because yeah. it's not. I'm like, look what this guy did. It would just be like, look at the incubator where this thing yeah. just grew from, and that was the fucking most horrifying shit of all the things we've talked about. This this is again. I feel like you always outdo yourself with me yeah. feeling even more uncomfortable. I that that's was the original goal when we came up with this podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, I had been lurking outside of your house for a while and I, I emailed <laughs> Sophie saying I would like to really make Miles uncomfortable about How twice a this? year over <laughs> over like a, a five year period. <laughs> Um, and that's turned into a very successful podcast. You know how, I know yeah. that? You know how uh, we know he's lying? He would never put that in an email. You're right. <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> email, exactly. <laughs> um, so I guess we should probably get back to the tale of Mr. Clarence Thomas. Now, when we left off with, um, with our old friend, he had gotten a job working as the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights in the Department of Education. Now, Number one, this is a job in the Reagan administration. So if you are the assistant secretary for civil rights for the DOE in the Reagan administration, your job is not to help ensure that civil rights uh, laws are abided by in schools. (laughs) Your job is to make sure that nothing is done to protect civil rights laws in the Department of Education because the Reagan administration fundamentally did not believe it should exist. And in fact, Reagan had campaigned talking about how there shouldn't be a Department of Education. So- That said, it was one of those like everyone, including Clarence, was aware that he got the job because since the Reagan administration was going to get up to so much fuckery, they wanted to have a black dude somewhere near the civil rights position in the Department of Education to like make it look like they were less racist than they were. Um, Yes, exactly. And this is exactly the kind of job to his credit. I mean, I don't know, credit may not may or may not be right thing to say, but like Thomas had never wanted jobs like this. Right. Right. Like in the past, he had always been like, well, no, I want to do energy. I want to do like um, oil and gas, environmental stuff. I want to do something that like people will not be like, oh, that's the job he's got because he's the black lawyer. Right. He wanted to like to push away from work like that. I want it because I'm Darth Vader. Right. Yeah. I want it just because I'm a bad person. I don't want anyone to think that it's because of. But this is a job that he is getting because he's like a black Republican. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Which is what he said he didn't want. But it's also the kind of thing he can't turn down this job this is a presidential appointment which is like a big right. deal and also like he himself in the last a couple or the, i think the episode previous you were saying like he saw it was clear to him the opportunity that present that was in front of him by being a black conservative like yes. so in that sense it's almost like well you know you know how why you're going to flourish because you're yeah. taking advantage of all of that but at the same time but then be like but i don't want to be diversity darth vader higher yeah. Um, and it's, it gets more uncomfortable. So it's uncomfortable for him, despite the fact that this is a thing he can't pass up. It's uncomfortable for him for that reason. And because a lot of basically all of his coworkers in the Reagan administration are like the most racist people you can imagine um, because it's the Reagan administration. He regularly described his coworkers to friends as bigots. Uh, Meyer and Abramson write in the book Strange Justice, quote, 
Carol H. Bell, who was Secretary of Education at the time, recalled in his memoirs being shocked at the sick humor and racist cliches voiced by some Reagan appointees who, for instance, referred to Martin Luther King Jr. as Martin Lucifer Kuhn, um, called Arabs sand <sighs> inwards, and described Title IV, which prohibits sexual, dis- or Title IX, which prohibits sexual discrimination as the Lesbian's Bill of Rights. So like, wow. not just like, you know, guys being like uh, crossing like the street or something when they see a black dude, guys like dropping hard slurs, the hard the- R's. Yeah. yeah, they're going they're le- They're letting the Klan hood hang all out. And I like and so Mr. Clarence Thomas is like, man, he's like, I couldn't even couldn't even regale them with my porn recaps yeah. because they're Can't being so even racist. Talk to them about pornography They're So <laughs> actually, I think he probably can. He was like, um, could you imagine or what's that conversation like where some dude is like, yeah, man, you know, the fucking Malcolm X and Martin Luther. I'm glad they got theirs. You know what I mean? Because we don't want the, you don't want the darkies to get any ideas. And Martin and Clarence Thomas is like, so I was watching this video of three women in cheerleading outfits. And you're like, this is a conversation in, from Hell's Waiting Room. So the Reagan administration models, I think if you were to like have a, a hidden audio recorder in there. It mm-hmm. would like any given hour of conversation in Reagan's West Wing would be too explicit for us to run on Spotify. <laughs> right. like, we we would get in legal trouble. The FCC right. would be like, we don't even have jurisdiction here, but like we're hopping in. You got to stop this. And we do hi- historically, we do not a lot. So, my God. But if Thomas was uncomfortable at all working alongside, you know, not just open racists, but like outrageously bigoted people. He was happy working adjacent to a man who made a fortune as the mouthpiece of literal apartheid South Africa. Now I'm going to quote again from the New York Times here. Quote, in 1977 to 78, when Mr. Parker, this is the guy we talked about last time, right? One of Clarence Mm -hmm. Thomas's uh, 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 mentors, first served as a South African agent. He organized the Lincoln Institute for Research and Education, which issued the quarterly Lincoln Review. The Institute and Review have consistently attacked the African National Congress, sanctions against South Africa, and the United States Civil Rights Movement's leadership and ideas. Mr. Parker and Clarence Thomas served on the Reagan-Bush transition team for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, of which Mr. Thomas became commissioner in June 1982. Since 1981, Mr. Thomas has been listed as an editorial advisory board member of Mr. Parker's Lincoln Review. Mr. Keyes has been a contributing editor. Registration filings under the heading Political Propaganda show international public affairs consultants held a reception for its South African client's ambassador in 1987, when Pretoria was vigorously fighting sanctions. Mr. Thomas, then the EEOC chairman, was listed as in attendance. Mm. So, mm. you know, getting getting money mm. and and getting like uh, uh, feeded at fancy dinners and stuff that are funded by the fucking South African apartheid government as part of their plan to build U.S. support for uh, continuing white love, minority rule in yeah. South Africa. Yeah, he's he's love fine a, with that. Love a human rights violation, food washing campaign, yeah. party washing yeah. campaign. <laughs> Come by, check out the junket. Be pretty fun. So uh, while Thomas's career flourished, though, his personal life, and I know this is going to really hurt you to hear because he was doing so well, was in yeah. shambles. So. His first oh. wife leaves him because, again, she's she's a very traditional like person in terms of her view of like men and women and like wants to be kind of the the homemaker ma uh, uh, wife. But also, mm-hmm. she's a very very committed Democrat. And when he starts going hard right, she looks at what's he's putting up with in the Reagan administration and is like, no. This is not okay. This is not right. like a thing that I want to. So she like she fucking bounces. Um, Cause she, yeah, she, it's yeah. funny how like kind of, she was such like a lib where she's like, my whole vibe was to marry this like other liberal black yeah. man. But now that you're becoming a conservative black man, this is, this is not good for my brand either. But I'm sure at the same time, you don't want to see someone you marry suddenly be so like yeah. transparently opportunistic I mean, it's, about it's like how those... they yeah, commodify their she, being in service she married of a guy i'm sure he was saying the same things to her that he'd said to his grandpa who was like i want to get be a lawyer so that i can get into civil rights so i can help the government and like you know he'd worked in a republican administration before but it had been a liberal republican um and now thomas is like no i want to help the chief ghoul of the far <laughs> right like destroy the civil rights gains of the civil rights movement she's like no i don't want to be involved with you um right. <laughs> he has custody of the kid, uh, which is which is, uh, you know, on his part, 
breaking a cycle. So I guess there's that. Um, that said, whether or not he's a good parent is um, something that's going to depend on your own personal opinions on parenting. <laughs> Friends say Thomas was so enraged at his ex-wife, um, and in part by the fact that whenever she w had the kid, he accused her of coddling him um, and of encouraging a learning disability. So he's that kind of dad where he's like, Oh, you're being, by being fuck. like this kid clearly has a learning disability and like you're coddling him and you're not being hard enough on him and making him work for it and all that kind of, you know, um, it works on animals. Yeah. Why wouldn't it work I with mean, this thing? Again, given his grandpa, hard to see I him know. not being that exactly guy, right. And like, also <laughs> like for you to be raised by such like a fucking cold you know, like shadowy figure of a grandpa have no like emotional or support or affection. And then like you merely just see like a mother and like child relationship. And you're like, you're coddling the kid. Mm -hmm. Got to slap him more. Got to make him work without gloves. I don't so, see you should see what you do. Like I said, you put a two 25 pound dumbbells in, mm -hmm. in the front of a shopping cart. You put him in the seat and you put it down a steep hill and just see how he ends up. Just mm -hmm. a crash test. Just a crash test. That's what yeah. you do. Yeah. Yeah, Miles, I'm raising a kid right now. The kid doesn't know it, and neither do the kid's parents. But every day I sneak in and I put a lot of, uh, what do you call it, uh, poison oak inside you know, his clothes for the next day. And what's that mm -hmm. teaching the kid is that life is like a series of blisters, and you just got to work through the blisters, you know? Little lessons I like that, that. Yeah. really make them stronger. And some say it's, it's, wa it's wasted because the child is so young and not able to process the experience. But what you're saying sure. is you, you said start them early. Start them early, right? The only thing they will grow up knowing is the feeling of constantly being exposed to poison ivy, and that will make them strong. And reject fast fashion. That's what I tell their parents in the letters that I send anonymously. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, once he gets split up with his wife, Clarence Thomas engages in the normal divorce guy things. He gets super into physical fitness, right? Starts getting jacked, you know? Oh, revenge body? Yeah, he gets the revenge body. And of course, he throws himself into his work, which given the fact that he'd always been a career guy, means he gets like way, way more into his job. And of course, right. you know, you can't just work out and work, right? Like that's not an, I know you and I, uh, Miles, are both just incredibly swole dudes. Um, oh, yeah. And I, I mean, but you know, you need something major else. Major gains. Yeah, absolutely 100%. absolutely yeah. look i mean they were saying the sec is coming after me because of these yeah, gains yeah uh you, you, just because our pecs are literally large enough to host a tea ceremony on like mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we don't do other things yeah. um i mean i could and i and i'll do it from time to time but yeah every now know, and then it's all uh, and, and and clarence thomas in addition to stacking gains and working you know he's got he's got his his favorite hobby which is pornography which he gets even more disastrously obsessed with Jesus. in the summer of 1982 shortly after he moves into his first bachelor pad he makes friends with a co-worker named k savage which is a pretty cool name it's wow. k with an e um they were both joggers and one day he agreed to take her shopping for running shoes so like they're work buddies and like they'll go running from time to time and like she's like ah my fucking my shoes are shit and he's like, well let's go out this weekend we'll get some shoes we'll go out and run it'll be fun so she picks him up from his apartment he doesn't have a car at this point he uses like a work vehicle to get to and from the office he gets like chauffeured and stuff um so she has to come pick him up from his apartment to go shopping. And that's where this subsequent scene, which is related in strange justice, comes in. And I'm going to read you a, a quote. Miles, st the... strap in for this one, buddy. <laughs> so interior shoe store. Okay. No, no, no. This is when she comes to his house. So this is her first time oh, seeing... on the way to go. To... Okay. Yeah. This is gotcha. her first time seeing Clarence in his bachelor pad. Interior. Clarence's bachelor pad. Oh, okay. God. Okay. Yes. He had only recently set up housekeeping, and the place, as she recalled, was still underfurnished. There was little more than a mattress on the floor and a stereo. But one other feature made a lasting impression on Savage. Thomas had compiled and placed on the floor, uh, and this is her, her speaking now, a huge, compulsively organized stack of Playboy magazines, five years' worth of them, organized by month and year. The walls of the apartment were also memorably covered. There was only one main room, but all of its walls, as well as the walls of the little galley kitchen and even the bathroom 
bathroom door were papered with centerfolds of large-breasted nude women. Savage recalled staring awkwardly about her. The display seemed so out of character with everything else she knew about Thomas. He was a fanatic about discipline and a daily churchgoer. He was serious about his career and honest to the point of indiscretion about his ambitious plans for the future. Thomas had told her, as he had told others, that he planned to replace Thurgood Marshall on his retirement from the Supreme Court. But his evident enthusiasm for pornography suggested to Savage that Thomas had a private side that was very different from his public persona. To her, the contrast seemed, as she later put it, a little crazy. (laughs) Dude has dude has wallpapered his empty ass apartment in porn centerfolds. Which if that is your like if that's your thing, fine. But number one, you don't ever let anyone else see that apartment. Like oh. you sure don't invite your female coworker over. And but you know he thought that would maybe in his mind he's like, and that's when maybe Kay's cool. Maybe you know Kay's I mean? chill because with it. That's yeah. my way of just being completely inappropriate to invite. Th- and also like you know like when in films when there's like a character that has a bunch of shit on their walls, you know it's usually like some conspiracy theory shit. Okay, so just because I like have some a- pictures of the child that I'm raising distantly on the wall, Miles doesn't make me crazy. Yeah, and also, like, it's weird that you seem to have, like, a design of the house in CAD, like, as mm-hmm. if you're making a, re- whatever, that's another show, but mm-hmm. I think when you see that in TV and film, usually it's like, this is what the inside of this character's head is like, right? Yeah. Is what you see just plastered on the walls, and then to be like, Clarence Thomas is in- existing at a steady hum of just porno blasting inside of his skull. Yeah. That, that's 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 exactly it. It's a perfect reflection of what his thoughts are, and it's yeah. nothing but pornography bouncing around in there. Right, because like none of the legal decisions make sense. They sure like, don't. Oh, I don't wait, oh. Whoa, what? It's like <laughs> it's fucking it's fucking wild, man. Um, and it's also like I'm sure there is because we're going to talk about Anita Hill later. Uh, he mm-hmm. obviously, I think there is like a a voyeurist. I think he gets off on like putting Clearly. women that he works with in uncomfortable situations vis-a-vis pornography and maybe part of how he protects himself is by also talking to porn to all of his coworkers, or maybe he's kind of into doing it to everybody right but like this goes beyond look again nothing wrong with porn i know a lot of people who like porn i don't know anyone who does this right like nobody no, does this, this. <laughs> No. And this is clearly like like to your point like that this is how he just violates people and that's that's his yeah. like, way of doing it is to be like surprise porn. I don't yeah. care what you think is appropriate or not like I'm this is this is it. Welcome. This I'm is either the talking thing. about it or you're yeah. surrounded by it. Yeah, if Ooh. you're going to be around Clarence Thomas, you can't get away from the porn. Now, K questions when are we gonna him get about to Ginny. This? Like all I can think of now is like what the fuck. Yeah, we'll talk about Ginny a little bit. There's not going to be as many answers as you're hoping for. No, no, I can I can only imagine. But yes, yeah, sorry. Go but on. so so Kay sees this nightmare apartment, which, the, by the way, folks, the correct thing to do when you step into your colleague's apartment and see that is to leave. If oh, you okay. have if you have a gun, pull it and keep it on them until you're safely clear of the apartment, mm-hmm. um, because that person is probably going to murder you. Um, but no, Clarence Thomas tells her she like <laughs> so she's obviously you're K in this situation. You have to be gentle about how you question Clarence about this because this is clearly an unhinged person. And yeah. and she she does question him gently and he's like, well, porn is my only vice. And since I don't drink or run around, like this is fine, right? Like I'm not, I'm not going out sleeping with people. I'm not going out and partying. All I do is enjoy my porn. What's the problem? Mm-hmm. Um, and he also told her that his magazines were all he had that was worth taking from his ruined marriage, which he has joint custody of the kid. Like, <laughs> oh no! So that's a little messed up. Um, wow. I'm now, sure it's... Okay. yeah. Now maybe he was telling the truth about like not drinking and partying. That might be true. There mm-hmm. are people who were with him at the time who claims no, he was also lying about that. Uh, one of them is his former girlfriend, Lillian McEwen. Um, she says that he was not honest about the whole not drinking thing. In 1991, she went on the Larry King show um, and said that when the two had dated in the early 1980s, he was, quote, a raving alcoholic, and that when he quit drinking, he turned into a, quote, angry, obsessive man who bullied his son. And I'm going to quote from CNN here. 
When he gave up alcohol, she said, he became angry, short-tempered, asexual, and obsessive with ambition and what she called weird things, such as long runs in the dark before dawn. McEwen did back up the allegations of his weird porn thing, calling it, quote, something that was very important to him and something that he talked about. So that's weird. That's a, that's mm. that's some stuff about about Clarence Thomas that I bet yeah. you didn't want to know. <clears throat> Definitely, you know, everything in moderation, uh, but not for Clarence. And it's hard to take someone seriously who's like, yeah. I don't. That's my only vice. Uh, no, actually, you have a lot of other vices. You have a, a horrible drinking problem, and you abuse your kid. <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah, Allegedly. sure, right? You, that's 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 very interesting. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, and it, and again, behavior. Obviously, in terms of like what you should take with a grain of salt, she is like going on the Larry King live show and talking on live <laughs> TV about this. So I, you know, maybe maybe she's not entirely coming at this from an honest point of view. I don't know whatever or she's like well who else can i tell about this maniac who might become a supreme court justice i don't know what you do if yeah. you're in her situation and you have that experience what she's saying doesn't sound separate from the person that many many co-workers have talked about yeah, um, yeah. at the very least there are many uh inconsistent uh, descriptions of this yes in May of 1981, Clarence Thomas was nominated by the Senate to take the position as chairman of the EEOC, his old stomping grounds. He was confirmed a few months later, and he held that position from 1982 to 1990. So this is the primary thing he does in his entire career prior to becoming a Supreme Court justice. This is the longest stretch of employment in a single job that he has in his career prior to, like, getting on the court. Mm -hmm. um, so while this is happening, while, while he is being the chairman of the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission thingamajigger. Well, that's going on. A doddering old man named Ronald Reagan decided it was time to nominate a new justice to the Supreme Court. Due to Reagan's eight years of executive domination and the fact that it looked like George H.W. Bush was about to basically be Reagan term number three, progressives and liberals alike were worried that the Supreme Court was about to take a hard right turn. Can you imagine how scary mm. that would be, Miles? Mm. Um, oh, no. So... People were concerned. Uh, in July of 1987, Reagan announced that his nominee was going to be Circuit Court Judge Robert Bork. Now, does that name mean anything to you, Miles? Yeah. Okay, so you have heard of Robert Bork. You're you're aware yes, of some I of have. this history. Okay, good, good, good. That name, I, I don't think I don't know how many it, other folks that that's like a thing that's familiar to. If you grew up right wing, his name was kind of a rallying cry for like generations of right wing media hobgoblins. Bork mm -hmm. was, in short description a dog shit judge he had argued that political speech was the only kind of speech protected by the first amendment uh he ruled in favor of a company who had forced their employees to undergo sterilization to keep their jobs he had opposed the civil rights act in 1964 for so long and with such vehemence that it's fair to assume he just hated certain colors of people at one point he argued in favor of a poll tax because it was quote very small so robert bork pretty bad judge yeah <laughs> yeah pretty yeah he's yeah we I, and and he even became shorthand for a word mm -hmm. oh yes we, we are talking about the shorthand <laughs> but you know what we're talking about first miles mm. products services all that good stuff mm. yes miles you love products don't you mm -hmm. and do you happen to like services oh my god oh oh yeah that's the shit. That, that's yeah. what gets my nipples hard, is a good old-fashioned service. service. Couple of products Please. with it. Anyway. Service me, Lord. Get your nipples hard with these ads. Oh, uh, we're back. Hi, everybody. How's it going? So, we've got Robert Bork. Dog shit judge. Ronald Reagan nominates this man to be a Supreme Court justice. And Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, the number two Ted K in this podcast, takes to the <laughs> Senate floor to warn that putting Bork on the Supreme Court would mean an end to Roe versus Wade and a return to segregated lunch counters. He said that if Bork were appointed, quote, the doors of the federal courts would be shut on the fingers of millions of citizens for whom the judiciary is and is often the only protector of the individual rights that are at the heart of our democracy. Now, mm -hmm. in addition to being a howling fascist, Bork was a pretty well-respected law guy in law guy circles because law guy circles are mostly made up of assholes. Uh, he had taught at Yale. His students had included Bill and Hillary Clinton, as well as Anita Hill and Jerry Brown. 
Um, mm. Many on the right were very much fans of his circuit court rulings, which included Dronenberg v. Zeck, where he and Justice Scalia, this is before Scalia was on the Supreme Court either, had ruled that there was no right to privacy that protected the right to have homosexual sex. During a case over prayer in school in reference to a Jewish person who was forced to engage in uh. Christian prayer, Robert Bork said, so what? I'm sure he got over it. <laughs> He's like a fucking cartoon. Fan. Yeah, he, bad judge. I would say not my kind mm. of judge. You know who my kind of judge is? Who? That judge from the uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. That's a good judge. <laughs> I support. Now, I look, Miles. For years and years, I've been saying that the primary crisis we as a society have is the expansion of Toontown, and I I agree. We have to get rid of those tunes, Miles. Oh, absolutely. We got to I mean, turpentine think- their asses. The thing is, the people, the the I guess if you want to call them people that live in Toontown, uh, uh-huh. they're sitting on such a bed of resources that they are unable to use properly and harvest right. properly because they're so, uh, I don't want to say it, not advanced, they're so primitive. That's right. Uh, and I think they're better Thank off Thank you for saying. Being, yeah, I think they're better off being relocated. So I agree. That, I agree. So there's the, lots the of land desert. is actually used properly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. exactly. Tons of desert. Anyway, this is Moving a- Moving on a Berry pro- Farm. <laughs> extermination of cartoons (laughs) podcast um who supports what's his name i forget the name of the judge in that movie it's played by uh doc brown um yeah well you all know so the 1980s are the first decade also the decade in which we get who framed roger rabbit if i'm not mistaken um Mm. are the first decade in which supreme court hearings uh like are a thing baron von rotten judge doom there you go thank you uh so we don't really have like public hearings for Supreme Court justices prior to the 80s. Um, And in fact, prior to the 80s, it had been pretty uncommon for Supreme Court nominees to like go before the Senate and answer questions at all. Um, Bork is the first nominee ever to get a televised Senate hearing, which doesn't make things better because maybe it's bad to do stuff like this. Maybe it inherently turns it into like a media circus that that like puts it to the worst impulses of everybody, but whatever. <laughs> um, so the first America's first experience, like watching a Supreme court, like nomination hearing uh, is seeing Ted Kennedy, like go after Robert Bork while he's up in front of the Senate. Um, mm-hmm. And by October, you know, the, the thing, the good thing about this is by October, a majority of Americans oppose Bork's nomination. So he actually, he comes in probably having the job locked down and the fact that this is all televised means that most people are like oh this guy's a fucking maniac so i guess you could say then that part that the televised supreme court hearings were a good thing uh he gets rejected on october 23rd by a vote of 58 to 42 but here's where the problem comes in the right cries foul which they do whenever anything happens, even when they get their way, because it consistently works for them. Now, in their minds, Bork had been unfairly pilloried, subject to the political equivalent of a mob beating. Um, <laughs> there are comparisons to a lynch mob, which, by the way, Robert Bork probably thinks is fine, because um, right. <laughs> he's that Jeez. guy. Uh, mm-hmm. And But whatever the fa- case, the, the sense of grievance over Bork's nomination gets burned deep into the conservative soul. Um, and it is it is still smoldering a few years later in 1991 when a woman named Florence Kennedy tells a national organization of women conference that when it comes to C- Clarence Thomas, who is the next Supreme Court nominee, quote, we're going to bork him. We're going bork, to kill him bork, politically. Bork, bork. This little creep. Where did he come from? So that is how borking becomes a thing that people yeah. talk about. I also uh, love the troll job that we got out of that because he was like, yeah. no one has privacy rights. And then they're like, here's your video rental history yeah and they're like because no one has privacy rights right and then they're then we get like the video privacy act out of that too he's just the gift that keeps on giving he is he is we've gotten everything thank you clarence so (laughs) since then uh according to vox quote in january 2001 the new york times even featured a chart of quote likely borkies and their probable score on the (laughs) borkometer referring to political (laughs) nominees for high level positions within the bush administration john ashcroft for instance received nine borks now you might note that john ashcroft did not get borked Um, no most of these guys don't it's it's just like a term that gets used probably because bork is fun it is fun to say it's fun to say bork fun to type bork i get it like if you're you're a new york times columnist most of your job is going to be pretty pretty dull and you get to use the word bork 
you know, why not? You know what I just realized? There's, I, I'm pretty sure in 40 year old virgin, that's what Steve Carell says when he's playing the poker game and he's tr- like lying about being a virgin. They're like, yo, are you a virgin? He's like, no, I've borked plenty of women. And Seth Rogen's like, you've borked? <laughs> it's just like this one line in it. And I'm like, wait. Oh, yeah. God, I haven't seen that movie in a minute. <laughs> that, I'm like, I always just thought of it. I'm like, wow, are you getting, is is Steve Carell showing his like 40 year old, like mm-hmm. 80s brain cred in there? Yeah. Well, okay. He, so he's, new appreciation he's, he's thinking about terrible film. I don't know. Has that movie aged? Is that is that one is that one still good or is that one oh, of those ones that I'm not gonna ma- feel, oh, feel yeah. great about? Oh, yeah, dude. flawless, 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 flawless. Okay, flawless. that's that's good. Just like other classic films, uh, we don't need to talk about Jim Carrey's oeuvre. So, borking <laughs> is now viewed as a widely used practice uh, among both Republicans and Democrats. Although it generally means attempting to bring down a high level candidate with quote personal attacks on something seemingly irrelevant to their jobs. Even mm-hmm. though that's not what anyone did to Bork, because the attacks were extremely relevant to the fact that he was basically a fascist. <laughs> like, right. couldn't have been more relevant to the guy Bork was these attacks. <laughs> right. Um. But, for example, Bill Clinton's first choice for attorney general, Zoe Baird, was borked in 1993 when news came out that she had hired an undocumented immigrant as nanny for her children uh, and her nomination gets withdrawn, which is, I guess, a borking if you're talking about it being irrelevant. Um, Because I don't know. I don't think that has a lot to do with it. it, Unless she's like super anti undocumented immigration, in which case then it is relevant. But I don't think she was. So. But again, it's also like, oh, uh, yeah. hold on. Like, how many of your businesses are doing the same thing? Like, yes. Well, scale, nobody wants to again, answer that question, is... Miles. <laughs> yes, exactly. Don't worry about it. It's don't do as I do, just as I say. For yeah. You to do. So the largest political consequence of the borking of Robert Bork was that the Repu- the Reagan administration uh, massively let down the right wing of the Republican Party. Right. Because Bork, they fucking love Bork. Like the fucking yeah. wing nuts are all about this guy and he doesn't get in. And they feel like Reagan didn't fight enough for him. Right. They feel like the rhinos let them down and didn't push this guy. So Reagan does get another justice in. It's I forget exactly which fucking one it is, but it, they're, they're not a, a lunatic. Um, And so the right wing gets very angry about that. And this wasn't it Kennedy. Yeah, I think it was Kennedy. Yeah. Um, And so conservatives start to feel like, well, we're owed a right wing justice. We didn't get what we are owed. This (laughs) is our (laughs) dude. And (laughs) that, my man, is where Uh, Clarence Thomas comes again. That's so freaky, too. Or it's the make good for Bork is Clarence Thomas. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, We feel like we deserve a guy who hates civil rights and wants to turn the, the, the clock back 100 years. And we wanted this like howling white nationalist but instead right. we'll take clarence thomas yeah and now you got neil borksich and bork mm-hmm. kavanaugh and, and amy bork cabin bork and yeah. bork garrett and i don't know i don't know i think if i made a joke about borking them it would probably wind up getting us on some lists sophie yeah hi hi how you doing good getting on some lists in a sick nightclubs mm-hmm. excellent so we should probably talk a little bit now about the man clarence thomas replaced on the supreme court oh Thurgood. you're done with the the borking that's it that's I'm, the only yeah. bork you got it out of your system i i did sophie thank you i okay. got it out of Call my system i'm just making yeah. sure we're all good here i made a lot of actionable threats in my basement before coming up here so we're we're fine oh okay cool 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 and yeah and now, yeah. And now we're moving on to to somebody that's really awesome or yeah thurgood marshall was pretty pretty based actually sophie pretty dope <laughs> Uh, also, I actually love what you said earlier, Robert, when mm-hmm. you were talking, you, you you threatened SCOTUS and you said, I'm coming for all of you. Call me Ernest Bork nine. That's right. That's right. That's right. I did say that, Miles. Um, I got to go, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> Just so, leave me alone. <laughs> Thurgood Marshall, number one, probably the best name a judge has ever had. That's a judge name. Like. If you're like a third grade teacher and a kid comes into your class named Thurgood Marshall, you're like, well, that motherfucker is going to become a judge, right? Yeah, like, that's yeah, basically yeah. like what you're not. You don't get to be like you don't get to be Thurgood Marshall and be like, I don't know, um, like a like a like a like a chemistry teacher or like a like a even you couldn't be like a nurse a as Thurgood Marshall. Like if I went into but the like, hospital and I I you, came across a nurse named Thurgood Marshall, I'd be like, get the fuck out of here! You're supposed to be a judge. Go get yeah. go, go into a courtroom. They're like, like, hold on, you're selling me NFTs? Hold yeah, on, no, man. you're like Marshall, way off track. Get your Marshall. ass in some robes. That shit's a judge's <laughs> name. Um, 
So pretty cool guy, Thurgood Marshall. The year after Clarence Thomas starts public school, Marshall is the lawyer who wins Brown versus the Board of Education, which is one of the most consequential cases in legal history anywhere in the world. Uh, Marshall, the great grandson of an enslaved person himself, went, goes through the public education system. Uh, unlike Thomas, he spends his entire education in segregated schools. So he actually like goes lives in uh, com entirely under segregation as, as like a person who's being educated as a kid. He gets his law degree in 1933 from Howard University, and he becomes a litigator for the NAACP. In Brown, his most famous case, he argued R.E. segregation that, quote, this court should make it clear that it is not what our Constitution stands for. Uh, he was a believer in the Constitution as a living document, one that could be used to push for greater equality and liberty for all. As a lawyer for the NAACP, Marshall won several landmark Supreme Court cases. In Smith v. Allwright, he helped overturn longstanding rules that made it illegal for black people to vote in party primary elections in certain states. It used to be legal for parties like their, the party in like whatever state to be like, no, 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 we don't. You guys don't get to vote in the primaries. Only white people can vote in the primaries. Um, <laughs> in Shelley v. Kramer, he forced the court to rule against laws that restricted non-white people from purchasing homes in specific neighborhoods. And in Sweat v. Painter, he got the court to rule that universities could not reject applicants based on race, all of which is like pretty cool shit. Um, right. And also, like, it's just wild, too. Like, these aren't complex legal arguments. He's like, no. yeah, how about, like, we don't do this shit? Mm -hmm. And they're like, this seems racist as fuck. And everybody says, yeah. wow, you are <laughs> the and, first uh, person to say that yeah. in the United States. <laughs> Counsel, what is your argument uh, that this is racist trash? Mm hmm. Uh, okay, I rest well, my We're case. very pro-racist trash, so... <laughs> and see, yeah. that's the fucking problem. Yeah. Okay, we can't be doing that anymore. Oh, interesting, oh, interesting. fascinating oh. argument. No one has made this before, Thurgood Marshall. Perhaps, um, perhaps we are all human. Hmm. He is, hmm. it, you might look at Thurgood Marshall as the guy that Clarence Thomas told his grandfather he wanted to be. Um, right. In addition to just being, like, one of the coolest guys to ever be associated with u.s government in any capacity like just a a pretty pretty dope dude <laughs> all yeah, things like, considered yeah like if like yeah people in american politics were like wrestlers like the yeah. belt that thurgood marshall would run into the arena with yeah like, oh yeah oh yeah, 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 yeah thurgood yeah. marshall's the guy who like racism is like doing his doing his little patter on stage for the audience and then thurgood right, marshall comes, comes in and hits him with a fucking Gong. chair yeah my god yeah. Good Marshall, go now. <laughs> exactly. The That's Undertaker exactly thing. what happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, it's probably worth noting that two of the three cases that we just talked about arose from lawsuits in the state of Texas. Um, I do feel like that's worth acknowledging. <laughs> okay, bring Texas right back in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, ne never far when we're talking about racism. Uh, if this had been the total of Marshall's career, he would go down in history as one of the most influential legal minds ever. Uh, but all of that was just a prelude. On August 30th, 1967, the Senate confirmed him as the first black Supreme Court justice in a 69 to 11 floor vote. I want to quote mm -hmm. now from a write up by the NAACP on Marshall's quarter century on the court. Quote, Marshall fought for affirmative action for minorities, held strong against the death penalty, and supported a woman's right to choose if an ab abortion was appropriate for her. The civil rights lawyer turned Supreme Court justice made, made a significant impact on American society and culture. His mission was equal justice for all. Marshall used the power of the courts to fight racism and discrimination, tear down Jim Crow segregation, change the status quo, and make life better for the most vulnerable in our nation. So, you know. Real fucking cool guy, huh? Pretty cool guy. But Just you know, ask getting all that shit done. Okay. You know who else is a cool guy, Miles? Oh, I know. The products and services that support this podcast. They also the want to change the status quo in your wallet. And I heard Thurgood Marshall would have used all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Every product we have on this Can show you imagine a is, is show backed that would... by the ghost of Thurgood Marshall. Just positing that casually. And honestly, I I feel like Thurgood Marshall probably would use that website. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Oh, yeah. And you know what about. he wouldn't use is any products sponsored by the Pod Save America people. None of those. Just no. behind the bastards products. Oh, absolutely. He said that to me at a seance. <laughs> Yeah, that's what you, that's what you need to start doing is making merch where it, it's Thurgood Marshall and it's in a quote that says, I fuck with cool zone, not crooked. That's right. That's right. Fuck them. That's what Thurgood Marshall <laughs> would probably say. <laughs> Sophie, are we allowed to do that? No. Okay, well, we did it. So Allegedly. here's the ads.
Oh, we're back, and we're talking about what products Thurgood Marshall would love. Yes. You know what I think, Miles? I think mm. Thurgood Marshall would enjoy the convenience of Amazon Prime. <laughs> you know, hearsay, but not hearsay. And, yep. Mm -hmm. You know what he? I I hear Thur, Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall's perfect morning mm -hmm. is to take his bird scooter down to Starbucks. Oh yeah, big bird scooter his, guy. <laughs> High five all of the very happy workers there. Mm -hmm. uh, and Who then, don't need to unionize. No, not at all. And to mm -hmm. remind them how good <laughs> they have it because of his work. That's okay, right. And to stay in Classic line. Classic Thurgood. Then uh, throw the hot coffee in the face of the Amazon Prime delivery person who's too late and slow with the elastic reusable uh, bandages that he That's needs right. for his dog's injured foot. That's right. That's right. And you know what? else I think Thurgood Marshall would have liked is Netflix. Mm. And I want to quote now from from a, a, a Supreme Court ruling in 1972, a, a majority opinion authored by Marshall. Quote, I fucking love it when I turn on an app and it immediately starts <laughs> screaming at me, just loudly playing a trailer that I didn't ask to play. That is my favorite thing as Thurgood Marshall, Supreme Court Justice. Prescient, prescient, wow, prescient. wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Powerful. Powerful. I love to hear that. Yeah. And also, Powerful. and then he also said, and also, this is, I'm surprised you glossed over the second part of that quote, which is, I, for one, would never share my password unless it's for Ever. guests within no. my home. One password, one use per account. If Netflix ever becomes a thing in the future, is what I think yeah. as Thurgood Marshall, Supreme Court Justice. His greatest regret. Uh, wow. Yeah. For, for, well, Greatest regret as a Supreme Court justice was not actually reeling in the rampant criminals. Yeah, that would, that, that would, that's you know, right. That's right. He saw it coming. The industry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, as American men in positions of power go, Marshall's pretty much your best case scenario, right? Just just about mm -hmm. the best legacy any any man with power has in in modern U.S. history. But by the later half of the Reagan administration, he is an old man. Uh, he is not in very good health. He has a bunch of fucking health problems, as most Ugh. old people do. Um, the court problem. had taken a distinct rightward tilt in the last years that he served, and Marshall found himself constantly writing minority dissents while the Reagan administration started to claw back some of the gains of the civil rights era. Um, at a press conference, he was asked how he wanted to be remembered, and Marshall replied as someone who he, that he wanted to be remembered as someone who quote did what he could with what he had, which is a very oh. sad. <laughs> that, yeah, that's oh. bleak as shit. <laughs> that breaks my heart. You don't want that to be what the Brown versus the Board of Education guy sees as his legacy in the Reagan yeah, as, as the exactly. Reagan years come to a which close. Which is wild because that's the excuse Joe Biden is using right now. Yeah, it is. Look, it is. Come on, man! I'm doing what I can. What yeah. I got. Fucking uh, Thurgood Marshall legitimately did everything he he reasonably like could. Withering away, he's like, "Fuck, <laughs> yeah. man, they really they're they're, yeah. they're packing this motherfucker in with these weirdos." Yeah, yeah. Now Clarence Thomas, for his part, seems to have hated Thurgood Marshall. In the Enigma of Clarence Thomas, Corey Robin writes, "Quote." Thomas had dismissed Marshall's liberal views as exasperating and incomprehensible. His rendition of the Constitution as a race-baiting vision that alienates all Americans and pits blacks against the founders. Which, how do you not? <laughs> like, yeah. Also, yeah, pit black people against the founders. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were most, most of them were pretty racist. So, yes, yeah, I, I guess, say, I guess yeah, they should be. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, I guess they, not that they should claim. be. I guess the founders pitted themselves against black people by owning them. No, no, no. <laughs> they are much more passive in enslaving people. <laughs> that's yeah. a passive activity. Yeah, it's it's fine. So holy shit. Uh, yeah, that's pretty bad, right? That's that's not good. That's not good. I, no. I would say. So in Marshall's last years, Ronald Reagan appointed four Supreme Court justices: Sandra Day O'Connor, William Rehnquist, Antonin Scalia, and Anthony Kennedy. And look. I don't like a lot of those folks, but I have to say, all of those really good judge names. Honestly. Oh yeah, like, Rehnquist is one. Oh of my the god, what an incredible judge name! And Anthony Kennedy, awesome judge name. Just really, yeah. none of them are Thurgood Marshall level judge names, but those are all solid judge. Tony K. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Not just mm -hmm. a fucking drug dealer out of rave. Yeah, dude. Sandra Supreme Day O'Connor too. Three. You got to have three. You know, that's what really that really drives it home. Day O'Connor. Um, I mean, John Connor. Yeah, exactly. Term, like, feeling like Terminator, which is interesting. Right. To take it to Arnold Schwarzenegger. I believe his fake name in True Lies was Harry Rehnquist. Oh, wow. So, See, that's... Wow, Miles, we're through the looking glass here. 
Yeah, sorry, folks. I did mushrooms this weekend. A lot of memories are coming to the top. So despite how right wing Scalia would turn out to be, this selection of judges, and these are like over the course of the Reagan administration, really pisses off American religious conservatives because all of those people are not right wing ghouls, right? Mm -hmm. They're kind of mostly more centrist and stuff in their actual mm -hmm. rulings and, and often centrist get, and stuff. <laughs> yeah. With the exception of Scalia, most of them kind of move more towards the center in time. Yeah. Um, which really pisses off the far right. So again, with this and with Robert Bork, they see themselves as having been betrayed repeatedly by an administration. Reagan came to power on the back of the religious right. He was supposed to be their guy. And they're like, he didn't give us everything we wanted. So when Reagan leaves office and George H.W. Bush becomes president, um, he gets a Supreme Court nomination. And instead of picking a guy the right wing fucking loves, he picks a dude named Thomas Souter, who is center right. Um, and this is, again, not enough. And and in fact, the right wing sees this as like the worst sin imaginable. Um, and this is a real problem because, again, you have to get this guy confirmed. And at this point, they're like pretty pissed off. Uh, Bush's chief of staff, John Sununu, manages to get the religious right in line behind Souter by promising that, hey, fucking Thurgood Marshall is not going to be around that much longer. When he quits, we will replace him with the worst piece of shit you can imagine. Like, I fucking promise. This time, we have your back. <laughs> Just give me one more shot, man. Just give us one more shot. We're, we will get a fucking ghoul Trust in there. Me. I swear I to got, you. I got a real real shitty hefty bag full of crap just mm -hmm. baking in the sun filling up with gas that i got for you. you're gonna love this one. <laughs> you're gonna love this guy time. you're gonna love God, this one speaking of nominative determinal determinism john sununu that is the name of a piece of shit whose entire job is to like whip fascists in behind like backing corporate tax breaks like mm -hmm. my god that's the guy that's the name you give that guy. john sununu are you kidding me yeah, anyway, it's, it's 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 not strong. It's not strong. You know, don't through the Reagan the years and into the early Bush administration, Clarence Thomas, while he's doing his shit at the EEOC, worked relentlessly to burnish his street cred with the far right. This meant he had to do a lot of explaining away his past civil rights activism, which he accomplished deftly by pivoting to complaining about how bad the civil rights era had been for black people. And I'm going to quote now from the New Yorker. Uh, that's pretty good, right? That's pretty good. Oh, my God. It's so disingenuous. <laughs> what the fuck? In his memoir, Thomas notes that part of the appeal of black nationalism was tied to his sense in the wake of the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy that no one was going to take care of me or any other black person in America. Eventually, this notion extended to the left. I marched. I protested. I asked the government to help black people, Thomas told the Washington Post in 1980. I did all those things, but it hasn't worked. The whole repertoire of black politics, from mainstream activism to black power radicalism and beyond, now seemed pointless. By the 80s, Thomas, a member of the Reagan administration, believed that state action could do nothing for African Americans. Problems of racial inequality cannot be solved by law, even civil rights laws, he told an audience at Clark College, a historically black school in Atlanta in the 1980s. In a 1987 speech to the Heritage Foundation, Thomas stated his belief that principled conservatism should, quote, make it clear to blacks that conservatives are not hostile to them, but instead that conservative views are the only real way to support black success. He repeatedly stated his belief that if you could get the whole racial issue out of the left-right paradigm, most black people would see that they were really conservative. I mean, there's some truth to elements of that. There are, there sure. is some truth. That, that's yeah. part of why it's worked. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> uh -huh. the amount of work this guy, my God. Yeah. And, and I mean, I mean is, it's no again, work when you're a ghoul, in terms like, of this like powered shit he's saying that's rooted in truth. Yeah, man. A lot of, I wouldn't call it the left, but the most liberals don't really want to do any more than use like race and, and civil rights as like a fucking whipping boy issue to hurt the right. Like, absolutely. There, there right. are a lot of false friends among the left in terms of civil rights advocacy. Yeah, for sure. It's, it, yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, for like liberals, it's more like being like a whiny guy being like, well, I mean, you really should be with us if you really think about it. Yeah. Like, without being like, but I'm not going to do any of the work. To, yeah, like, I'm not going to fucking do anything. Move towards liberation for you. But if you think about it, like you can't yeah. be with them. It's like there's again, there's these elements of truth. And then he's like, and so that's why I'm at just like lining up behind the racists. Um, right. And I think that's what makes it's it like, so, OK, well, <laughs> yeah, it makes it also so in, like insidious too. Yes. It's like you, you just find that little shred where you can say that's the truth. And then like and that's how I justify the absolute ushering in of the hell world. 
Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of the hell world, most of the claims that Thomas made about the origins of his own conservatism were rooted in absolute bold-faced lies about his background. And I'm going to quote again from Strange Justice. According to Sam Williams, Thomas's lack of gratitude for what his grandfather and the civil rights movement had done for him formed the beginning of an estrangement that became so irreparable the two were barely on speaking terms at the time of Anderson's death in the spring of 1983. What made his grandfather's bitterness particularly sharp was the sense that Thomas had betrayed him, according to Williams, who said that early on, Thomas used to tell his grandfather he was going to be a civil rights lawyer and come back here and help his people. Instead, Thomas just helped Thomas. He saw that the money and career opportunities were on the other side. His his grandfather was so disappointed he hardly spoke of Thomas in the later years. Yet, in his public speeches, including his Supreme Court confirmation hearings, Thomas spoke often about how much he loved and admired his grandfather. It is likely that his sense of gratitude grew in the years after his grandfather's death. He did, after all, keep a photo of his grandfather on his desk at the EEOC. But both Sam Williams and WW Law also charged Thomas with distorting the truth about his upbringing for political effect. In an interview, Law said, I don't like talking about this because Thomas is low and that makes it very hard. He then shut his eyes and in an agitated voice added, Thomas just said those things to make him seem black, but all along he's been making choices to benefit Thomas and no one else. Yeah, that sounds about right, Mr. Lizard Brain. Yeah, and just like, okay, I don't, like... It, the time to actually express like love and admiration for my grandfather is publicly in books, even though we're not really talking, because I think the fact that my grandfather was a hard-ass and mean will sell with conservatives 100 percent. even though he was a committed civil rights activist for all of his flaws like i am going to paint him as like the the platonic ideal of a right-wing dad because right. he was a dick uh god he's so opportunistic and you just see like whenever there's an opportunity to you know create or add more weight to the myth about him like he's yeah. willing to do that for absolutely anything yeah but you know what miles i don't know I don't know what, Miles. You know what I do know hmm. is that it's time for you to give your pluggables. Hmm. Well, uh, I don't know. You know, just steal some catalytic converters, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah. Jack a fucking catalytic converter. Yeah. I think I think we can all there. agree on that. Oh, that's what I want to plug. I got uh -huh. a new, I have a new, uh, it's a new shirt that I made. It's designed for people who steal catalytic converters because it has a rigid back plate with wheels. Oh, ooh, so very you can nice. Just immediately you see something, get on your back, slide under, clip it, you're yeah. out, hop in their homie Civic, and mm -hmm. you're off, baby. Uh, they're called Cat Shirts. Uh, check them out at catshirts.meow. That's how mm -hmm. I throw the authorities off, but it's for stealing catalytic converters. You, yeah, you that, know I mean, that that website exists. Absolutely. Cat I mean, shirts and, and, dot meow. You know, Miles, <laughs> I, I think it's only fair here to quote Thurgood Marshall once more, uh, who said <laughs> in a in a 1977 ruling, quote, I dream of the day in which a man is able to steal a catalytic converter in less than 90 seconds, even if the car has skid plates protecting it. Wow. There it is. Again, ahead of his time. Ahead of his time. Absolutely. And your and we, product and is ahead him. of the rest of the market. Yeah. Um, so follow us at Cat Shirts Meow mm -hmm. on uh, all over. And if you're yeah. interested in me, the creator of the product, uh, mm -hmm. check me out at Miles of Gray on Twitter and Instagram. And or remember. Listen to me on my other show, Daily Zeitgeist, where we talk about all kinds of tips for stealing those cat converties. Mm -hmm. And remember, folks, every car that is capable of driving is a policy failure. Mm -hmm. Steal more cats. There it is. Meow. Ah, oh, we did it. We did it, everybody. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.